it's uh, really a pleasure to be back again, getting to talk about my fun that I've had at RSI, I guess. Um, so let's get started. Um, first things first, I'd like to just point out a question that has made many cosmologists puzzled um, in recent times. There's these things called globular clusters. Globular clusters are just big blobs of stars that orbit around the nucleus of the Milky Way, the um, central bulge in the Milky Way. Um, and they also orbit around themselves. So they're sort of spinning like this around the center of the Milky Way. Um, and one thing that's very strange about them is they don't have any dark matter. Now, pretty much everything in the universe that has stars has a certain amount of dark matter. So cosmologists uh, have really been going, well, what on Earth makes these globular clusters have no dark matter? Or rather, what in space makes these globular clusters have no dark matter? Um, so where is it all? Well, to answer that question, um, we're going to go back quite early to the um, just after the Big Bang. Um, in the early universe, there was a plasma. It had baryons, it had dark matter, and it had photons. Um, and they were all sort of scattered fairly randomly um, just around the galaxy. Oh, sorry, around the universe. Um, now, if we step forward in time a little bit, what's going to happen to this field? Well, gravity is the main, um, the main force acting on it. So we're going to have an infall of matter occurring. So the baryons all group together. The dark matter also groups together. Um, and we get these, these over-densities forming. Um, over density is just is an area that is more dense than the general background universe. So something interesting happens in these over densities. The photons, because there's so many um, photons in one small area and there's so many baryons, we get a lot of pressure forming, a photon pressure. When you try and cram a bunch of photons into a small space, they don't like being crammed, so they start to try and push outwards. But an effect called Thomson scattering means that they actually couple to electrons. So when they're trying to push outwards, they're hitting so many electrons, they're bouncing and reflecting off them, that they cannot um, escape. So they bring the electrons with them. And because our electrons are negatively charged, and we have protons as well, they're positively charged, the electromagnetic force um, pulls them along for the ride. So what we get happening is this outfall um, of baryons. And this outfall is a baryonic acoustic oscillation, a motion outwards from an initial overdensity in the early universe. Now, the outside of this um, baryonic acoustic oscillation is called the sound horizon. However, that's not the whole story. We also have to remember about this gravity that was pulling it in initially. So we've got a photon force pushing outwards. We have gravity pulling inwards. So these baryons, they sort of just form an equilibrium and, and sit still. Um, so we get roughly stationary baryons. But the dark matter? Well, that doesn't have any of this photon pressure happening. So the only thing the dark matter does is falls in. What this forms is a relative velocity between these two types of matter. So we've got baryons sitting still, and we have dark matter pulling inwards. This graph here, uh, our axes, just to explain, we have um, the velocity relative to the initial overdensity um, on the y-axis and distance away from the overdensity on the x-axis. Um, and this Green's function is just the relative velocity between the two. So we see the dark matter is falling inwards towards the overdensity. It's got entirely negative relative velocity, uh, sorry, entirely negative general velocity. Um, the baryons out until the sound horizon, which we can see is this peak here at 150 megaparsec, um, the the baryons are stationary until that point. Their velocity is zero. So we can see the Green's function tells us this total relative velocity. If we think about this in terms of matter distribution, um, we, as we, we can step forward um, in time um, and see that what's happening here, the gas, which is our baryons, and the photons are coupled together. So they are moving outwards together. So we can see the, their, their groups. Um, the other thing to notice is the dark matter is generally towards the um, initial overdensity. So what we get happening here is a spatial offset. And 
Um, so we got baryons, dark matter, and they're moving apart. So what we get left over is a bunch of baryons that don't have any dark matter. Now, doesn't that sound like a potential solution to these globular clusters? So my project was um, to calculate the relative velocity in the Milky Way as a result of all these baryonic acoustic oscillations. Now, one thing that's really cool is that we can um, take these galaxies that we see in the sky today, and we can know that they were where the initial overdensities were. Because if we had an overdensity in the early universe, it just kept pulling in matter, and we get a galaxy forming. So if we track where the galaxies are, um, and we have uh, the distance away, our Green's function will tell us what the relative velocity is as a result of that, um, as a result of that initial overdensity. So if we take that for a bunch of galaxies in the sky, suddenly we have a total relative velocity that's impacting the Milky Way. So in order to do this, we need a data set. Uh, we used the two mass redshift survey, which just gives us a bunch of data about the um, coordinates in the sky and the redshift, which we can convert into the distance away um, from our galaxy. So we have a bunch of positional data for galaxies all around us. From this data, um, we, can, uh, we can compute the total um, relative velocity. But this data is a little bit limited. Um, you can see here, this is the galactic plane. So when we look into the sky, we have the Milky Way sitting um, in the middle of it. The Milky Way has got a lot of dust, it's got a lot of gas. Uh, we can't see through that, essentially. Um, so we get a big chunk of our data missing. What also happens um, is the number density, as we move outwards, is not consistent. So what this means, uh, generally in the universe, there is, for a given volume, there is pretty much the same amount of galaxies. But um, as we move outwards from the Milky Way, our data didn't, um, didn't match with this. So what we had to do was limit some of the data um, so we could get this, um, this occurring. The reason, uh, the reason it doesn't fit the um, density, the equal density, is because um, as we go further away, distant galaxies are harder to see. So we just don't get them in our records. Uh, so yeah, we limited our data set, which unfortunately meant coming down from an expected 100,000 galaxies down to only 10,000. Um, so there is a little bit of limitation here. But in the end, um, we plugged in our 10,000 galaxies and we calculated the total relative velocity based on those. So um, the reason, oh, this is our x-axis relative velocity, our y-axis, and our z-axis. The reason these are in units of sigma is because generally it just makes a little bit more sense to look at um, how different they are. So then we can see how different we might be compared to others. Um, so generally, the, the one we're looking at here that's the most interesting is the x-axis. Uh, and a sigma value of 1.9 just sort of means we're slightly unusual. We're sort of on the, it's a little bit strange what's happening in the Milky Way based off our um, observations. Uh, so with our, um, with our data, what we can start to do is draw some trends potentially. We can calculate what's the relative velocity here? What's the relative velocity in Andromeda? What's the relative velocity in all these other galaxies around us? And then we can draw some trends between the relative velocity and the, um, amount of globular clusters we find and start comparing and seeing if we can actually find a correlation between these. Uh, also what we can do is generate some mock galaxy data, which looks very cool, uh, and we can um, work out just how much this, uh, this data matches or just how much our calculations match what we would expect to find based on knowing all of the galaxies. So we don't have to be limited by only having 10% of the, uh, the data. So that's, that's what's in the future. Um, so I would like to make a few acknowledgements. Uh, firstly and foremost to my mentor, Dr. Zach Slepian. He is a total legend and he made everything uh, really easy and um, like explained things so well. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Daniel Eisenstein, who's my mentor's mentor. He is one of the smartest dudes I've ever met. Um, and <laughs> He, uh, he's really good at explaining stuff clearly. So those, those two work together and just help clarify everything. Um, 
I'd also like to thank my colleague, um, Andrew. We worked on this project together, and uh, it's, the collaboration made things run a lot smoother. Um, I'd like to thank my tutor, Dr. John Rickett, for tons of feedback, um, my sponsors from the NYSF, uh, the RSI, MIT, and the Center for Excellence in Education for making this all happen, um, and a bunch of RSI staff, special mention as well to Abby for uh, slashing me with some criticism that was really constructive, and uh, he helped me refine and uh, make things uh, a lot better. So um, thanks, everyone. OK, um, thanks very much, Matt. So questions from the judges. Hi, a uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you for um, bringing a topic that probably none of us really uh, hear about a lot or relate to and making it something that we can at least have a conversation about. My question is maybe something others are wondering. What is the day-to-day -day life of a researcher like for somebody doing this sort of research? Like, What do you physically do with them on, during the summer the past month? Yes. Okay. Um, so I worked at the Center for Astrophysics um, at Harvard University. And cool. There's, okay, there's a lot of, I mean, it's the summer at the moment, so I don't know if that's actually a proper representation of what life's generally like. Um, but there's a bunch of PhD students, and they are some of the most casual people, casual, like, um, <laughs> just cool people that you've met. Um, there's a lot of social functions. There's um, 3 o'clock, tea o'clock, which is just where we go out and have tea and talk about um, you know, like our projects, collaborate, things like that. Uh, the actual research side of things, um, it involves, because cosmology is sort of hard to get um, observational data because you either get it in a telescope or like just look up a survey. Um, so it becomes uh, just just running lots of computer simulations. It's mostly out of your office. You don't generally walk up to the door and look through a telescope and try and get data like that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of office work, um, but there is a lot of collaboration. We also had pizza time, which was that's, that's a pretty big highlight as well. <laughs> so, so I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that uh, most observational data is collected by big telescopes, and I was wondering, um, is there an alternative? Since your data set was so restricted by how much data you had to cut because you were looking at things very far away, is there an alternative data set that you could potentially use to confirm your results? Um, well, as an alternative data set, like, it's sort of hard because the, the main data set that fits our, um, our it's expensive to run right. these sort of things. So they don't um, duplicate, they don't double up. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the one that fits us the most because we need data out to 200 megaparsec um, and we need it all around us. Mm -hmm. um, so this is 2012 data. So um, until future data collection is done, that's really the only data set we have to work with. So, that was a very exciting presentation, and since um, I don't know the units, even the units, uh, probably mega parsecs, far from us, to, uh, from from your field. I have a high-level question. Um, you started with very nice explanation of mechanisms behind behind forming the dark, dark matter. And you posted the question why uh, you didn't observe it in a specific location. So very high level question, how your results prove or disprove the mechanism or are supposed to prove. I kind of, at that point, I kind of lost the logic. So without going to details, uh, too, too, too many details. OK, um, so the question here is, how does our results actually prove that um, we have or why we have globular clusters formed? Um, why, why you don't have it in uh, Milky Way? You start, you, I think, I might be wrong, you said that in one specific location. You didn't have dark matter, and you said, why, why on the Earth and in the universe we don't have it there? Was that? Um, OK, sorry. I'll clarify that. Uh, in the Milky Way, um, and in all other galaxies, pretty much every galaxy yeah. we've observed, we have this thing called globular clusters which is just big groups of stars. Yeah. Um, inside these globular clusters, we don't find any gravitationally bound dark matter. So they don't have any dark matter sitting in them. You don't. They don't, OK. Which is it's quite strange. Um, 
But there is there is a number of these in uh, every galaxy. There is multiple popular clusters um, around all these so, galaxies. So what was the problem that you were addressing? What you were trying to understand? What we were trying to understand is um, how, or what's the reason behind these globular clusters not having dark matter? Not having dark matter everywhere. Uh, dark matter is everywhere else, but the globular clusters. No, but not in the clusters, OK. So then I get back to my original question. How your results help to understand why you don't have there the dark matter? Um, OK, so how do the results help to understand that? Yes. They, at the moment, um, they don't, really. That's, these, uh, these results in, in, few, in future. In future? OK, we will be trying to draw connections between um, the relative velocity in a galaxy and how many globular clusters it has. So if we look at the Milky Way and we say, OK, our relative velocity is about 1.9 sigma, yeah. um, and we know it has, let's say, 150 globular clusters, yeah. uh, we can we can plot that. And then we move on, we go to Andromeda. We can say, OK, it has a relative velocity of 2 sigma, and it has this many globular clusters. We can start defining a trend between um, these two things. I kind of understood that. I'm sorry for taking time. What I'm trying to understand how, and I think I understand how you get from velocity the number of clusters. What I'm trying to understand how that helps you to explain why you don't have dark matter inside these clusters. Okay, so the reason we don't have dark matter inside these clusters, we're proposing that it's because of this spatial offset as a result of the velocity. Uh, so the reason they're forming yeah, is you, because um, we have baryons and dark matter moving at different speeds. So then what we're finding is that potentially more globular clusters are forming. Uh, thank you. Uh, good. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, being patient and a clear explanation. Thank you, sir. Do we have any further questions from the judges? Um, one question. So we show that um, the different uh, planes are different in terms of velocity. What is the error? What, what is the error in these measurements? Uh, to be frank, the error is unanalyzed at this point. Um, the result is that we're working on that um, over the next few weeks. Uh, my colleague Andrew is continuing trying to get some error bars on this data. Uh, the reason is, as I said, we had 100,000 galaxies. If we want to get a proper result, we need to know where all 100,000 of them are. Currently, that's just not feasible. So we use 10,000, and we hope that they represent um, exactly what the actual distribution is. We don't know for sure if they do, and we'll be doing some further testing on our simulation data to work out if they can actually trace it effectively. Fortunately, we're out of time. Thanks very much, Matt.